Today, I will present four coding patterns that are related, uh, deeply related to continuous delivery. And uh, uh, beware if you have some intolerance, because uh, I will show you some source code. I will tell you some story about Formula One software development, and there will be some discussions. I will ask you some questions. You will be able to ask me some questions, and probably no one will have our answers. But that's OK anyway. So this is me. Uh, I have a technical background. It's almost uh, uh, 20 years that I'm professional in software development. I work uh, in Formula One when Kimi Raikkonen win the, won the driver championship. Uh, Ferrari won to construct our championship. And then Massa, at the last race, in the last lap, during the last corner, lost the championship against Hamilton. Well, those of you that are from UK are happy about that. I was crying. <laughs> this is Paolo, a co-worker of mine that collaborated creating this session. He worked at, uh, in Ferrari with me and remained there for many more uh, years. He actually, he's a C++ expert, but today you have only me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. In 2006, I joined the Scuderia Ferrari uh, to work there as a, an expert. Software there is a mission critical and life critical. The software is used uh, at the own factory as well as during uh, the race. Cars run pretty fast and sometimes important information uh, that goes to the driver come from the software. And nowadays, actually, all the cars is controlled by software, starting from the brake, for example. So in that sense, the software is definitely uh, life critical. High availability, especially during a test and race event, uh, a team cannot afford to stay without telemetry, for example, while uh, some technician switch to a different version of the software or when the software has a showstopper bug. Uh, software is client server and distribute, and there, are, there is also remote connections. McLaren, I think, has been famous for having the remote team at home. Uh, in Ferrari, for a while, database will travel in together, database servers together with the car on different test and race event, while at the same time, software were also running at the own factory. This is the type of uh, software that we were uh, working with. Some of the software is running inside the car and uh, is controlling the engine or generating telemetry and controlling a lot of different sensors. Other software is running on the pit wall or in the, at the home factory uh, to control the production, to design the car, to take care of the quality, and so on. Uh, there are many simulations. Uh, race engineers are very good with mathematics and physics uh, and use MATLAB or Simulink to create a simulation of, uh, of the car. At the same time, they are very good at coding. At least some of, the, some of them is very good at coding and use uh, uh, tools like Excel. They have the ability to uh, connect to our platform and to the data and uh, uh, try to write some algorithm or make some calculation that they find uh, uh, useful. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like mobile apps. Uh, these Excel are like client application that are getting access uh, through our platform. It could be like a client server or a, uh, through API on the cloud. It's pretty similar. So when I joined, uh, uh, I, I've been asked by my, by my boss, we would like you to help us to go faster with software development I'm talking about, not with the car. I'm a good driver, but not that good. And to go safer at the same time. How can you go faster and safer at the same time? How can you increase the speed of software development, reduce the number of bugs, and increase reliability? That was a puzzle uh, for me. 
And then when I start to get to know the rest of the team, I realized that everyone else in the team was an expert. <laughs> so that was really a humbling experience. On top of not knowing the answer to this puzzle, how can we go faster and safer at the same time? Really tricky thing. So in the team we had, uh, for example, Neil Convin, um, is kind of a famous uh, Microsoft employee, one of the first one. If you watch uh, movies on Silicon Valley when Apple and Microsoft were fighting in order to go out with the first operative system with the graphical user interface, he was the guy that was uh, uh, working, um, the Microsoft guy working at Apple, that then went to Microsoft and uh, created the first uh, version of uh, version number two of Windows that went out in the market before Apple's one. And then Paolo Pulce, you have seen the picture there from Connextra. Connextra is a famous uh, London uh, team, one of the first uh, using extreme programming and one of the longest running. So if you are into agile or into extreme programming, some of the practices that you are using today have been invented in that team. I'm saying that there was a lot of great people and I was very humbled to join such a team. I already told you this is the, uh, the link to the source code if you want to take a look. It's a link to the readme, so you have to get there with the browser and then copy and paste the GitHub URL. So this was the challenge, right? Go faster and safer. It turned out that we had some constraint that in retrospective actually help us a lot to solve the puzzle. Uh, the first constraint is that Formula One calendar, the sporting calendar, is inescapable. There are races, race, race event mandated by the calendar. The race start at one o'clock in UK, in Italy we say at two o'clock instead, and uh, you cannot postpone the deadline. Also, what happened is that your software is used during the race and you see what's working and what's not. So very often you have that inescapable reality check. And it turned out it was an incredible source of learning for us. We made a lot of mistakes, I definitely did, and I learned a lot from that. The other constraint is that uh, guys in the team as I told you, were pretty smart. So they had this type of remediation plan. No matter what, when there is a showstopper bug, they were able with one click in few seconds to switch to the previous stable version, even during the race when the car was lapping around the circuit. As I told you, you cannot afford to lose the telemetry. Maybe there is something wrong in the suspension. The driver is running 300 kilometers per hour and uh, the race engineer need to see that in the telemetry and say to the driver, stop, slow down and stop, don't kill yourself. <laughs> so they had these remediation plans and they work very well, except that sometimes there is some compatibility breaking changes that don't enable you to roll back. So uh, that was a, a challenge that helped us to actually help us later on. The last one was about the source code repository. In the middle of the championship, we realized that the source code repository had a bug. And uh, every time that we made a merge, potentially uh, the source code repository could do something crazy when there was a conflict during the merge. So potentially introducing uh, bugs or something that was completely nonsense. And we had to stop to use branch, branching because replacing the source code repository at that time during the championship wasn't possible. Everything was connected. We had an integrated a development environment that I thought was very cool, except that when something doesn't work and you have, want to replace that, you have to replace everything, including the version of the framework. So we say, let's wait, let's stop using branches until the end of the championship, and then we will update to a different source code repository. So here they are four pieces of the solution, the four different coding pattern that I'm going to present today. 
Um, I created a, a sample code. It's an extremely uh, simplified version of a software that uh, uh, calculates the simulation of a lap time, uh, taking into account the tire degradation. Real applications typically take into account other factors like the fuel, for example. The car run consume fuels, the car become lighter, and so can go faster. But th this simplified version take care only of the tire simulation, the degradation. The degradation of the tire reduce the grip, and so the car goes lower until you replace uh, uh, the tires. But then you have it to take into account at the time of the pit stop. Is it worth to replace uh, the tires now or not? And so let's take a look at the, at the uh, s sample code that I'm using today. And let's try to run it. It's extremely simple. I, I keep uh, the bare minimum uh, that is enough to show uh, the problems and the four pattern that I will introduce today. So it's asking me for an ideal lap time. The ideal lap time for a driver. This is a parameter of uh, the simulation and is suggesting me a default value. It's asking me the uh, degradation. seconds per lap. And then he calculate, in this extremely simple example, uh, f the, the lap time from lap five to nine. Can you see, can you read it? So it's a pretty simple application, right? If I run it again, you will simply see that I have a default value. So it keep in memory the um, simulation parameters for me. As you can guess, there is a storage somewhere. So if I press enter, it simply use the default value. Here we go. Questions so far? Um, it was 2006, uh, so it was a pretty old one. It was Visual Source, source Safe at that time. <laughs> and I think a patch, uh, so after that, the patch has been released. So, huh? <laughs> Other questions? So, let's see how. Uh, we calculate the lap time simulation. During the racing weekend, uh, of course, drivers try uh, to flying lap uh, on the track and try to find out the best lap time. Uh, they do that uh, in the free practice and also during the qualify session. So every driver has his own ideal lap time. But then every tire has a degradation function. Every lap, it goes lower and slower. And you have a function that define uh, the degradation. It could be extremely simple, like a linear one, but this is just good for our example. In reality, the function can be very complex. There are some functions that just take some uh, parameters, and changing the parameters, you get a different uh, tire degradation. Nowadays, it's much more complicated, so you just take the data point of the function. Anyway, this is what we use today, and it's good enough for our example. Let's take a look at the code. We have the parameters uh, that we use in the simulation. Uh, the simulation itself is uh, simply a mathematical formula. Uh, storage that uh, uh, write and read back the parameters. Do you remember the default uh, uh, that we saw during the demo? In reality, uh, the real application will have the race strategy. 
that the person that is responsible for the strategy will create one strategy or many versions of them. And then you have a program that uses all these uh, parts. The storage, of course, you can think about it uh, as a database, but could be also an API in the cloud. So the storage is, re is really, again, uh, this is a sample application, but we could be talking about a mobile application, a web application, cloud application on, on WAS, microservices, serverless apps. It's really the same. The pattern that you are looking into uh, works in all these different environments. Okay, and uh, the first version of the application that I just saw you, let's call it version one. And the storage, let's say that is a database uh, version number 10. Uh, I'm simulating the database with the file. What is interesting here is that I'm simulating a relational database and I'm simulating the fact that the changes that we will introduce, because soon someone will ask us to make some changes to this software, some improvement, the changes will require a, ch a change to the database that break compatibility. What's next? So here it comes, uh, the race engineer, and say, oh, now we want to do better. We want to improve our uh, tire degradation function so that our simulation are better, right? We want to take into account uh, the tire operating temperature. When the truck has the perfect temperature, the tire uh, performs at its best. But when the truck temperature is different, you have to take that into account. And uh, we have to do that with no branches. So, some more theory. Let's see how, uh, what is the impact of the temperature of a tire. Here we have the ideal tire temperature. Here we have the ideal lap time. And whether you move to the left or to the right of the ideal temperature, you have a degradation of the lap time. We are again using a linear function to simplify things, but it's not really like that. So this is it. Let's take a look at the code and let's see what, what can we do to start to make those changes uh, working without branches and then dealing with the uh, breaking changes on the database. And let's see if you can help me. If you do well, I may hire you in Formula One. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at the simulation. This is the main program, a very simple wiring of the storage. Uh, if the storage is there, I try to read the parameter, and then I run the simulation using the parameters. Running the simulation means uh, asking input, uh, the lap time and so on, uh, using the default value, and then uh, running the simulation for real. But let's look at the mathematical function. If I can read from here, yeah, it looks like this. So this is the calculation of the, of the lap time. It's very simple, right? We have the either lap time, and then based on the lap number, we had the, the degradation per number of laps. And that's how we calculate the, uh, the lap time of a specific lap number. So basically, the old math is here. And uh, what we want to do is we want to introduce, uh, start to introduce uh, the impact of the temperature. But we do not have branches, so we don't want to break the existing code. Do you have any idea about how we could do that? Sorry? Uh, you're suggesting a default parameter? Yes, yes. Um, we'll use something similar later, later on. So that is a good idea. Another idea? Change 
Perfect. Yeah. So uh, you are suggesting a formula where the zero doesn't make any impact on the previous simulation model. Both of your ideas combined together will come later. Uh, what is the first step, the first uh, minimal step that we will do now? Sorry? Yeah, you, you enable one version or the other. Okay, all good ideas. In reality, the first step is much smaller. So we will see all your ideas later on. Good, uh, good intuition. Go. Yeah, that's the first step. It's very minimal. Before going to your step, that is the, the initial one. So let's do that. Is it clear? Do you have any, do you have any questions so far? Uh, soon we will be able to do that. You're very good, just too fast. <laughs> uh, there was m one more question. Yes. Yes. So the reason uh, for not breaking backward compatibility is to preserve the ability to roll back the software to the previous version anytime whenever a showstopper bug show up during the race and you want to preserve that ability. If your change is a breaking change, you will lose that ability. So that's the reason. Yeah. So, yes. So the initial implementation of the rollback was actually switching to the previous binaries. That was the initial implementation. You are suggesting a very good idea, and we will see that in practice. We will go and use that idea too. Ma makes sense. Okay. Let Let me show. Let me show. And. Uh, Thanks, lot, lot of great ideas. So it was just me that I was bad at that time. <laughs> so let's take a look at the, uh, at the next version. And this seems to be, no, this is the simulation. And here we go. The first step actually, it's just uh, an overload. Yes, is a, the default value could be a syntactic sugar that's per perfectly equivalent to the other one. But for now, uh, the difference between a default is that this code is not used or exercised at all, except for the tests. If I go here, only those two tests exercise the new code. So if I run this test only here, that code is used. Interesting. Here we go. Okay, so let's see what's next. Here we are, version 2A, backward compatible, yes rollback version the previous one and the database is the same so far 
So those are the two patterns that we introduce. Uh, Track-based development. We are basically working on the main line so far, on the uh, trunk or the master. Uh, we are not using branches just because we couldn't at the time. And we have this pattern that I call latent code. The code is there, but is used only by the uh, test. But it's still there in the binary that goes into production. So at least we see that that code is not breaking anything for any strange reasons that could be related to a bug of the compiler or whatever. At least we get that feedback. And but this feature actually takes more than one week to be developed. So uh, the next race, uh, we won't have that feature available. In Formula One, some of the systems are available only during the, at the racetrack. So that's the only moment where you can test for real some aspect of your software because those external systems are only available there. So you do not want to lose uh, the possibility to learn things at the track side. So here we are, the feature is not completed. You, you have seen uh, what was the previous state of the code. We have a few time left. We won't finish the feature, but we would like to take advantage and to learn something. Before the race, we won't be able to finish the feature. What can we do? What are the minimal steps that we can do to learn something from running the software in production at the racetrack? Any idea? Uh, Definitely, that's, um, that's a good idea. Uh, can be used also at the own factory. There is a pattern for acceptance testing that actually replay uh, all the telemetry and enable you to compare two versions. In some very difficult situation, we are talking about backward compatibility, uh, it's not possible to have two versions. Sometimes, and we will talk about that later, uh, there is a constraint about having something that needs to be unique. So in all the other cases, that would work. So that's a good idea. So you are suggesting to um, um, the function still to return the original value and also to log uh, uh, the new values and later on compare it. Yes, your idea uh, can be combined to the previous one to create uh, uh, this uh, comparison. Yes, it's definitely a good idea. Uh, any other ideas? Any more ideas? <laughs> um, I, I can tell you. I can tell you what the driver uh, will answer. Uh, I want a car that go faster and that everything should work. I'm here to beat Hamilton, and I don't want to have other problem. That's your job. Give me the best car, the best strategy, and uh, and uh, yeah. I I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's how it works. Exactly, so. So it's, it's similar, um, the pattern that you're suggesting is similar, it's just a different version. I say that it's similar because for some application, that's definitely the way to go. Sometimes there is this constraint of unicity, you can only have one. If you don't have that constraint, you should do exactly what you are saying. And I assume that here we have uh, uh, this constraint. So let's see uh, the first step. Yeah. 
allow you to, to try to keep your other leg unless you risk losing your tool to me. Well, um, uh, it's actually it's interesting. There is a concept behind that that everyone uh, it's a sporting competition at world level, and also some company live in that situation that are competing at the forefront. Everyone is uh, uh, trying to make the best uh, uh, they can, and everybody are already trying to use the maximum risks uh, that they can handle. Every additional risk uh, cannot be added to someone else. What you're suggesting basically is uh, uh, moving that responsibility or that risk on someone else. Like for example, uh, hiring an external company and say, oh, it will be their fault if something goes wrong. But we are in the same uh, team uh, and, uh, and, and the answer will be the same as before. You have to make it work. Um, yes, uh, you are suggesting to uh, switch back. I, let's go back uh, why uh, I mentioned the database before. So the assumption is that the database break the backward compatibility and the volume of data make it hard to switch back quickly. That's the assumption. This is a file with uh, three numbers. So it's not real, it's not uh, uh, relational database that doesn't have that uh, data manipulation language that cannot enable you to roll back. But I'm simulating that constraint. And in other situation, it, it happened like that, that we cannot uh, quickly go back because of the volume, because the number of clients involved. Yes. We can't put new code into production because it's unfinished, but we also want to put still the initial constraint that we can all run one of the buttons. Yeah, that's correct. I I show you I show you, I think it's one of the idea that has been mentioned uh, before actually, is the one that you proposed before. You're right, I think you too already give the solution uh, uh, at the previous round, uh, actually. You're just one step ahead. You don't know, but you are one, one uh, lap ahead. And you definitely are, because this is the solution that you described uh, uh, before. We start to exercise the new function using the default number. So the users and everything will still go through uh, work as before, but we start to exercise part of the new code, at least in a special case when the delta of the temperature is zero. So if I run the test, uh, and here I'm uh, running version 2b. So if I run the test here, not only I have the additional tests that run with the temperature, but all the other tests, uh, as well as all the other feature of the application, end up exercising the new, uh, the new code with the parameters that is zero. So I can see this binary uh, will go, uh, this binary will be used in production at the track, Part of the new code will be uh, exercised, and I can learn from the production environment that nothing is broken. Imagine that there is a bug, something strange again. It could be a real bug or something related to some technology involved. And imagine that uh, running that code will show that there is a bug. A component that is used is not compatible with the production environment, for example. And we do not use this technique. The next race, the real one, when we have the feature ready, we will start to use uh, the feature. We will immediately identify the showstopper bug, and we will have to roll back. We are safe, fine, 
but the team and the driver won't have the competitive advantage of the new race simulation model for that race. Instead, if, uh, with a technique like this, we anticipate the testing, we spot that bug early, because that bug we are making the assumption was already here. When we finish the, func the implementation of that race, uh, the competitive advantage will be there. So I don't know if you follow the first race of the season, but uh, uh, Mercedes, because of a bug uh, in the uh, race simulation uh, strategy software, uh, lose against uh, Ferrari. They say is a bug. Uh, uh, you could say, I guess, it's a feature that was missing. They were not calculating the overtaking uh, in the pit lane. It's a feature that actually uh, I implemented many years uh, ago with Luca Baldissari. I don't know if my code is still working there because I'm not working with the team, so I don't have an idea. But uh, uh, you understand the importance of software. It makes a difference. What if that happened at the last race? It can make a difference between winning and losing the championship. That's right. Uh, you, won't have, you won't be 100% certain that you will catch all the bugs, uh, but even partially exercising the new feature, you will eliminate, you will learn something. So it's more than nothing, and that more than nothing is good, because it happened that sometimes you will spot the bug. And uh, the cost, so that's, that's correct. It's, uh, it's not 100%, but it's still valuable. And, uh, it costs zero, so why not doing that? So we use, again, trunk-based development. Uh, we were still releasing uh, on the main line. And then we have this new uh, pattern, Latin to live code. Version is 2B, uh, is backward compatible. The previous version is 2A, and the database is not changed yet. So this is Latin to live code pattern. We are gradually transitioning the latent code that we created before into production in order to maximize the, uh, the learning and getting feedback as soon as possible. Getting uh, the most possible value from production while keeping the software and the code base always in a releasable and safe state. So that's the uh, one of the pat new patterns that we introduced. And even nowadays, it's not very well known. While the trunk-based development is a very well-known pattern, this one is uh, still uh, uh, not very well documented and known. Okay. But now we have one more week before the next race. Everything was fine. No bugs found. Uh, so far, or if they were found, we, we would be able to fix it. And now we need the UI because we have an additional parameter. Actually, what is the, the uh, degradation impact of the temperature and what is the actual temperature of the track? Our software needs in the UI to have those two additional information. And then uh, the storage, uh, we need to add and store this, informa this additional information. As I mentioned before, there is the assumption that we break backward compatibility, and because of the volume of the data and the nature of the database, we cannot switch like this in real time as much as we need. And the, what we are, uh, the next step actually, I'm going to use one of the answers that you suggested before. You are too fast. Maybe you are really Formula One uh, developers. Uh, is to introduce a flag. So we create the new uh, UI, we create the new database, and we introduce a flag that enable us to switch from one version to the other. Let's take a look very quickly.
we had a feature toggle that is our flag that we read from a configuration file that is here. It can be true or false. It's the simplest uh, possible uh, implementation. When we create the storage, we inform the storage of the value of the feature toggle. Same things when we read the parameters, so the UI will act accordingly, asking or not. And same things when we uh, run the simulation. So let's see what happened. Let's try the software. Oh, seems like is running uh, as before. I'm using the default to save times. Still working, right? Now, let's try to switch. To let's enable the feature. What's going on? An exception, why? Where is this exception? With the parameters. Oh, this is the storage. So now I'm trying to access the version of the database 11. And this is the breaking changes. Here it is, uh, telling us that if you run the binary with a different database, things doesn't work. So that's exactly what I was expecting. Let's stop it. And this is my, oh, you are not seeing it. This is my fab fabulous database, a file of 32 bytes. I clean it. I run it again and Oh, now you're asking me how much uh, second uh, do the tire lose for every uh, degree of temperature when it's far away from the ideal temperature. Let's say that this is it. And now the temperature of the track is 9 degrees off the ideal temperature. And here I have my calculation. So as you see, the software is working one version or the other, one database or the other. And that's the idea that you suggested uh, before. Let's take a look at the test. And you see, yeah, even the test has, has the feature toggles. So based on the feature toggle on the test, they can run in one way, or if I go in the test on the test, and I change it here. Thanks. This is more than pair programming. This is mob programming. There are many eyes on it. And you see that the, the switches changed from one version of the database to the other. Let me check the time in the right place. Let's run it again. Yes, you see the... So this is where we are. We introduced the feature toggle. And here we have, this is the new version that can work with two databases, the old one and the new one. If we use it with the old one, it's still backward compatible. The previous rollback version is the previous version, and the database is still the same. And that's how we are going to release this version the first time, or at least that's our next increment. And this is the pattern. This is another pattern that is well known nowadays. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, very well known. Uh, and given the constraint that I mentioned you before, 
we end up uh, uh, inventing uh, that pattern uh, ourselves. What's different from nowadays are two things. We didn't have a, a framework to deal with feature toggle, and we were extremely uh, disciplined. Can you imagine we release features every week, and the focus of every small team is on very specific features? So you will never forget those feature toggle in production. As soon as the feature is finished, you will clean up uh, the feature toggles and the related uh, uh, code. So in the end you don't need the frameworks because you keep things so simple that a file and reading a configuration file is good enough in those situations. So now please. Oh. Uh, in the comments, then you see a problem and it's just to do the black flag and pause and uh, You are correct. Let me clarify. For now, we are releasing this version only with the, the old database. And we have to deal exactly with that problem. It's not solved, right? You are spot on. Uh, So uh, most of the tests, uh, uh, you saw that only four or five tests, uh, tests uh, the yellow one, were switching in two versions. Uh, those were the integration tests, or at least for this extremely simple example, uh, I wrote the integration test that tested the database and tested uh, both situations, when, when there are no default value or when there are already uh, default value existing. And, also crossing uh, the, the versions. Uh, so only those tests uh, uh, are switched. But all the other tests uh, that remain the same, uh, uh, they run always. Uh. And that's, uh, I think that's pretty common. I found myself uh, implementing, uh, uh, dealing with this, uh, and uh, usually you have a smaller set of tests that uh, switch, uh, need to be switched. So let's go back to the problem that you were pointing out. We still have a bridge here. There is a river. We are here or we are there. We cannot be in between unless you learn to swim. But in Formula One, there are no pools on the track, so you cannot swim. And Let's talk about uh, what it means, uh, uh, backward compatible breaking changes. Usually, in order to have uh, uh, breaking changes, you need two moving parts. Let's make some example. You have an application and a config file. You change uh, the config file because the new version have a new format. You switch back and your application crash unless you do something. You have a mobile app that uses a document. You change the format of the document, you roll back, your application crash because cannot read the new version of the document unless you do something uh, specific to deal with that. A web application with the database, I'm talking about a, a relational database with some changes that are uh, incompatible. If we talk about a NoSQL database, it could be the volume of data that can be the problem, not the uh, schema. The component. Um, some operative system have components that are global to the operative system, or at least to everything that run inside that container. So when you switch to the new version of that component, and then you roll back the binary of the application to the previous version, it will not work anymore because it's expecting the older version of the company. Those are all examples of uh, compatibility breaking changes. An API of a service, 
you update the API, you take away the old version for some reason, you have to replace the API. The client application is updated to the new API, you discover a showstopper bug, you switch, and it doesn't work anymore. Are those examples cl clear so far? I would say something controversial, no? So I think we, we probably, you, I'm not sure, but you, you are all very smart from your answers that uh, you gave me before. So I'm sure you will, you will find a way to deal with those breaking changes in a way that works. So this situation is still manageable. I just need to hire you. Things become more complicated when you have many different mobile apps. So not many different users with the same mobile apps, but many different mobile apps and many users using each one of those apps that work on a shared set of documents and you switch to the new version of the document. How can you handle that? Do you have uh, any idea? How can you deal with these breaking changes without uh, getting into trouble? Sorry? And use both of them. And what about the documents? Uh, you're talking about uh, the old document. So that's really interesting. We are going back to the concept of uh, the ability of using both. That's definitely the simple solution. So if you have, for example, Microsoft Words, and you update to the new version of, uh, of Microsoft, and you update the document, or a new version of PowerPoint, you keep both versions, at least for a while. So if the new version of PowerPoint crash, you use the old one, and you will assess the old version of your presentation or of your Word document. And same things for OpenOffice or LibreOffice or uh, whatever Office uh, suite you are using. For a web app with the shared uh, database, uh, actually this is quite common. Many organizations use database uh, kind of a common repository for data used by many applications. This is still uh, can be difficult unless you create a copy of the table that you are changing again, the idea of copying. Global <coughs> component, well, if you can only have one, that's kind of difficult. How do you manage that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think you are one step ahead. Uh, the answer is good. You're just answering the next question. <laughs> no, it's good. it's good. It's a good idea. You're making my work easier. Thank you. Uh, sorry, any other comment? Yeah, that in some cases work. A glob, uh, component, you could uh, have the setup that uh, roll back also the component. But if you have many applications, that can be time consuming still if you have to update uh, hundreds of applications. Uh, and uh, well, with the service, you will try to have a, a copy of them. The idea of having multiple interfaces is a concept uh, that is called branch by abstraction and is actually used in similar situation. Uh, Paolo uh, rewrote the architecture of the telemetry. It's the heart and blood of every software application in Formula One. Telemetry is really the core. And changing the architecture means changing how the streaming work, uh, uh, if it is real time or not, if you optimize the payload of the packet, or if you optimize the sequencing, and so on. Uh, and in order to make this change that is extremely difficult, is used uh, the concept of branching by abstraction uh, on steroids. He used this concept, uh, seeing a, a telemetry application as an operative system, and seeing the different version of the part that support the telemetry as apps. 
And so they were able to dynam dynamically load different versions of the telemetry architecture in order to test it and uh, uh, try it uh, with some of the idea that you mentioned before. But things become even more difficult. I'm not happy enough. I had the trouble that we had to deal with. When is mission and life critical? So there cannot be downtime. On top of that, you have a single source of truth. Sometimes uh, the second moving part is a single source of truth. You cannot always have two copies, the old version and the new version at the same time. Sometimes you need to have just one version. That must be unique and need the conformity. For example, in telemetry, if you look at historical data, one of the things that race engineers do more often is to compare. They change the setup of the car and they say, what changed? Are we going faster or slower? And if you are going slower, where? They need to know the detail and compare. This is where the uniformity is there. So in this situation, the idea of duplicating or branch by abstraction doesn't work. Here we are. We have the old word and the new word. The problem is still there. Any idea? I think you give an idea before, and I think that's the question that uh, I think you answered. The idea is to create a bridge version that can work with both words, the whole database and the new database. Even if you are ready to jump from here to here, because here we have the feature toggle, and we are ready to switch the toggle and go to the other side of the bridge, and that is the problem that also you were pointing out before, we need this intermediate version. In that version. That's, a, that's the second problem. That's the second part of the problem. We are arriving there. So we are just preparing, but we haven't solved your problem. You are, you are correct. So in order to implement what I just described, actually, we did most of the work uh, in the previous version, the version uh, 2C. What actually we are doing is asking the storage that the storage now is automatically testing which version of the storage is installed. And that's who, who suggested this before, automatically testing uh, which was the version. I remember some of you suggesting that. I was dreaming. I was. So this is what's happening. The storage actually test the version of the database, could be the version of the uh, PowerPoint, the document, or the API, and based on the available version of the second moving part, automatically configure the feature toggle. So that's how the binary out is automatically able to work with one database or the other. We can test it, we can try it, and we can deploy it. And what we do, first of all, we want to verify the binary. So we deploy it, and we deploy it with, again with the old version. The only difference here are the feature toggle. Here is self-configuring, based on what is there, is switched from here to there. So This is a forward compatible version. This version is still functioning like the old one. The flag is telling, and the database version is telling, behave in the old way. But at the same time, this version is forward compatible. I'm here on this side of the river, 
but I could also function as a binary on the other side of the river. And that's the concept of forward compatibility interinversion. This, uh, uh, so That's right. Uh, do you remember when we switched the data, uh, the version of the software before, and uh, we had an exception because uh, the that underlying database was of the wrong version? So what the storage does is to try to access the database, and based if the uh, read succeed or fail with that specific exception, it understands which version of the database is there, but. We are talking about the database. That's a very specific case. Could be trying to assess an API, access an API, call an API, and uh, realize that you get an error message because, uh, uh, or uh, g trying to access an interface and realizing that your client has a different uh, uh, a reference to an older interface. I think it's a very interesting point. So I'm showing you an example. Uh, but what you need to do in the specific case, it's up to you to figure out in your specific context what is the simplest solution based on the specific uh, compatibility breaking changes. And there is another bit that uh, actually another assumption that I'm telling you that you have to figure out uh, that worked well for me because it's not done. And now we have to move the database. So it's still to be shown that these things work for us. And it worked for us because there was some assumption in place. I will tell you, but you will have to make sure that in your specific case that assumption is there for you too. So we released the second version uh, of a 3A that we call 3B. The only difference is that in the release script, uh, we upgrade to the new version of the database. So the binary is the same, but now we start to look at the new database. We convert the old database, or at least we duplicate and create a copy of it. So the binary, the, this binary and this binary, we prove running them in production, we prove that they are a stable version. No problem will come from these binaries. The only problem will come eventually from the new database. And since we just made the copy. If something goes wrong, we can easily uh, switch back to the old copy. There is zero downtime. We are not in between something. It won't happen that somewhere we find an unexpected bug here, and then we realize, oh, we have to switch back, and we have to convert back this database. It will take uh, five minutes, more likely one hour, and the race is finished. This sounds fishy. Let's see if you spot. Uh, it's truly very <laughs> yes. <coughs> there you go. So you are here. So 3B has a part of code uh, that has not been exercised while it was running with the old database. The 3B package uh, that actually is the same tree, a binary, just pointing to the new database. And so, some, uh, some, some code that, or some uh, sequence of execution of the code that has not been exercised before. So something new is happening there. Yeah? Another thing that could be go wrong. So in production, this database has never been tried. There can be something in production that will not work. 
And this is where it's up to you to find uh, uh, the solution. In our case, uh, the solution for this case was OK. That part of the code was a no-brainer. The database things was absolutely linear. It means that if happen a problem in the code that has not been exercised, or if happen something in the database when it's running on production, that will be spotted immediately for the nature and for the simplicity of those parts of the code and those aspects of the database. Do you remember the flag? Do you remember the storage of the test, uh, the reading and the version? That part of the code immediately go through all those parts that you are uh, quoting, those parts that could be wrong. So the only thing that can happen is that the first time that we try the application, we start the application, the application tests the reading, and that <coughs> is the, all the testing that is needed to exclude what you described. And those tests will happen for certain when we start the database because of the simplicity of this case. So what I'm telling you is that when you have these compatibility breaking changes, you have to identify the simplest part that you can leave last when you do this. There is, uh, there is the uh, bridge here, sorry, there is the river. You are uh, on one side or on one boat. You are putting the feet on the other boat. You are still in between. The boat can go on <laughs> to side and you can fall in the end. The last things that you leave, uh, the last risk that you leave must be the smaller one. Is that switch, that smallest part that is untested. And that is contestable. No one can uh, sell you a framework. No one can sell you a recipe. It's up to you to identify what is that part. So it's difficult to see that you're already using the values of your, say, Adam and Converse today uh, for the other people's values. So you know all these things for and you're not even aware. And therefore, the only switch is just whether you're reading it or not. Yes, there are. So to be specific, um, there is uh, uh, the code that read the new value that has never, uh, has never run in production on the production database. And then there is the production database that actually execute that query and return the result. Those are the two parts that are not tested in production, never. Correct. As the version? No, no. Um, no, no, it's it's much simpler. As you say, there are two parts of the code that has not been tested into production. The one that switched to version 11, 11 and then uh, the interaction between the binary and the version 11 in production. Those are one line of code that do the switch, and then is just the one uh, read and update query. So the application goes straight ahead on version 11 and immediately execute those two risky parts. But it takes only the task on version 11, which was already available in version 10. Yes, uh, the, the additional part is that now this is running in production. This has only been tested in, uh, in the development and test environment. And the reason, the important that uh, that will be um, spot immediately is that uh, uh, we don't have additional data, so rolling back to the old copy of the database will be at zero cost. If this will be discovered later, that could be a problem. So. We have this new pattern of, of forward uh, compatible interim version. Why is it so important? It's important uh, uh, to deal with the uh, compatibility breaking changes. Nowadays, everyone talk about continuous delivery. Definitely, the automation of the pipeline is one of the key things. It's like thinking of, about a car. You want to push the gas and go fast. But there is the second part of continuous delivery that most of the team and the organization don't do, and is the recovery plan, the ability to recover safely. 
do you identify if your new version break compatibility or not? And have you tested your rollback plan when you cross that uh, compatibility boundary when you cross the river? Because you can release in production faster, you can run your, can your car faster only if you have a break. Uh, and when something goes wrong, you can uh, remediate quickly and without costs. If you just go fast and you crash, that is not continuous delivery, that is continuous madness. And uh, there is an underlying concept that is extremely powerful. Uh, uh, professor that worked in finance uh, uh, in 2002, for some strange reason, went in con was in contact with the extreme programming community and in a conference introduced this concept of reversibility that actually came from economy. The ability of having multiple options, the ability to take in decisions, and the cost of rolling back those decisions. And he realized that through uh, economical studies that irreversibility is one of the prime, prime drivers of costs and risks. Now, if we go back into software development, whether it is a continuous delivery and dealing with breaking changes, whether it is creating a new design or making changes to a software system, a skilled software developer and a skilled architect, designer, engineer has the ability to identify those changes that are irreversible and has the ability to turn those irreversible changes into reversible ones. And the quality of a designer is having extremely limited situation that push you toward that uh, irreversibility. Quite a complex concept, right? And still, there is an extremely easy way to spot if you are doing that or not. It's easy. You can enter the room without looking at the source code and the system and you know if you are doing it or not. Do you know what it is? If you are uh, growing your system, keeping changes in a way that it is reverse, are reversible or not. How can you spot it? Sorry? <coughs> couldn't uh, you try to reverse uh, okay without uh, uh, even touching the software it's easier you don't even have to touch the software you just need to enter in the room at the right time actually that you need to do there you go there you go you enter the room before the release when you have a reversibility, you, everyone is very relaxed. The release is quite calm, is a known event. People is relaxed. In a different presentation, I use a picture of a, a Jenga tower or a human tower. That's the feeling when your system has a lot of uh, irreversible parts. Every single addition is bat is trying to add uh, another uh, part on top of the tower. When it is reversible, it's boring like trying to find where a piece of the puzzle, the next piece of the puzzle fit. You cannot crash down the chair, the chair or, uh, uh, on the floor. It's very relaxed and you immediately spot it. Yes, there are teams that are extremely juniors that they don't know what they are doing and that they may be relaxed uh, just before <laughs> crashing, but uh, I never met one. Very good point. 
Yeah, if you are removed from the production environment, you cannot even understand if there is reversibility or not. Yes, that's correct. So here we are, version 3B. What is left? Only one thing is left uh, to do. Oh, you make me so happy. <laughs> And the version 4, I'm not going to show it, is exactly uh, going to do that. Those are two graphs. Uh, they are available from McLaren. They're published in the internet for McLaren. Uh, the first graph is a lap time, uh, different uh, uh, laps here. You have two cards. In that case, uh, you see that the lap time is going down. So that's not about the, the tire. What's that about? Correct. So this is an example of fuel consumption. And every lap uh, go faster because there is the first uh, less fuel. The red the car start with all the fuel on board, so it's lower since the beginning. The second car start with the less fuel and then have a pit stop. The cum cumulative time of those lap time will tell which of the two arrive first. And if your simulation software make the right calculation, Vettel will win the race and uh, Hamilton will uh, take away his smile from the face. <laughs> uh, the second chart instead is a chart of uh, um, uh, gaps from the leader of the race uh, for different uh, drivers. Because what happened in reality, uh, I show you an extremely simple version, but the race simulation uh, also run in a real time during the race uh, and calculate all the possible consequences of different actions. So that's an example of gaps and data that is used in real time to calculate uh, or to compare different strategies. In the end, uh, we have introduced uh, or uh, we solve uh, my uh, challenge, uh, our challenge, uh, through four uh, coding patterns. The track-based development, Latin to live code, feature toggle, and forward compatible interim version. Uh, Latin to live code and forward compatible interim version are those that are uh, not well uh, known today. I heard um, uh, Kent Beck uh, talking about uh, live data migration, two-way live data migration. Uh, they can do that because they can migrate a subset of users. We cannot migrate a subset of drivers or a part of the car. But that's an example how they handle reversibility. And Ken Beck actually pointed out uh, the article of the same professor uh, going back to the important, uh, importance of reversibility. Same things did Martin Fowler. That's correct. And uh, uh, is exactly in the release uh, uh, that become a known event that uh, uh, whenever we introduce a breaking changes, we need to take into account the forward compatible interim version. Interesting thing, the way that we invented the, those two patterns initially has nothing to do with continuous delivery. Well, the constraint helped a lot, but it was something different. At the beginning of the championship, uh, uh, some uh, uh, engineer can change a uh, uh, team at the last minute. And you have the new software for the new years, the new algorithm, and you don't want them to take the software to another team. So there was kind of a, a, a key that was changed to make uh, uh, that software stop working. And that was a forward, uh, uh, backward compatible breaking changes. And we realized, oh God, when we do those changes, uh, we find ourselves very nervous at that uh, uh, race. Because if something goes wrong, uh, we left engineers without the ability to deal with the, uh, with the strategy. They couldn't roll back. The, the previous version was expired for security reasons, right? And that's how we invented uh, uh, this technique. 
This technique has been invented for something that is exactly the example that I've shown you. It's super simplified to hit the corner and the problems that we discussed, the source code that is shared, but that's real. And together, end up to be a perfect match for continuous delivery. Yeah, so uh, as you see in the championship, uh, uh, most of the races uh, happen uh, weekly. Some races uh, race happen every three weeks. Uh, in, in Ferrari, we usually release feature every week. So most of the time, we manage to split the feature, uh, producing value every week. But time to time, a few times uh, during the championship, there are features that cross uh, require more than one race, so very few. And in those version, uh, in those situations, we use uh, things like this. Because the value, um, people oversimplify. Every feature needs to deliver value. Actually, the real version of that assertion is that every feature needs to uh, create validated learning or, and or deliver value. So even if you cannot deliver value, but you learn something from production, that's still a uh, For the database, so for the database itself, you can do in in a one race. The difficulties come from the the binaries yeah. when it is just the one. Yes. Oh, some of those you have seen different version here. Uh, yeah, you can do estimation about how much time it will take, but you never know. When you develop, uh, and that's a very good point, uh, you always uh, develop a small step that keep the code base in a releasable state. So even if for some reason at the last minute you do not manage to finish the feature, you will still manage to get some learning. So most of the time, uh, those are two races. Those are two races. Uh, two weeks. But doing small step, whatever happened in between, you are always, uh, you know, when you do the job from one boat to the other, you are always in equilibrium and you never fall in between. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think someone called that pattern the impostor pattern. So you, you capture uh, the live data and you play it back at home. And uh, naturally, you have to create an interface uh, uh, to those servers or to those sources. And in the test environment, you can switch from uh, the, re the real one, that would be for the production, or a fake uh, server that you can use for testing. So we had the those. Uh, uh, for the timing system, for example. So we were able to play back the timing system that are only available during race and test event. So that's another good idea. I think you find it documented as impostor pattern. We invented that. Uh, actually, the first ver time that I use it, I have to use a spoon on the keyboard to keep the key pressed because the guy that created that feature actually was for a human bead. Pressing the, then uh, uh, as it happened, the source code got lost. We only had the binary version, and we need to make a change. So the solution was to use a spoon, uh, put a spoon on the key, and. Uh, <laughs> the Creativity. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Correct. 
Yes, that's correct. And when you realize the impact of the changes that are irreversible, you start to figure out a way to avoid them. So most of the time you will manage to avoid them as long as you spot them and you understand the consequences. And sometimes the consequences are really big, other times because there are, not, there are no constraints about unicity, about uh, mission critical, about time, and that you can uh, deal with some of the great ideas that you uh, gave me before. But it's uh, really about the ability to spot those things uh, and uh, deal with that. So one of the rules that we had in the team, do everything to avoid breaking backward compatibility. Do everything that makes sense. Okay, is there any more question? I think the time is almost finished. And uh, if you want to discuss more or get in touch, and uh, I ask you please the feedback uh, form, uh, if you can uh, uh, give us some uh, feedback, what worked well, what we should improve in this session, will be very useful. If you want to get a copy of the deck or some uh, link to reference material, also leave uh, uh, your uh, email uh, in caps lock in a way that is easy to read. <laughs> Thank you very much.